Good evening and welcome to Spirit of Grace Church. We're so glad that you're able to be with us tonight. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to 2 Samuel 7, uh, I want to hopefully share something from the Word of the Lord with you that will help somebody in recognizing that God is in control. And I want to speak on this topic. It's entitled, A Forbidden Purpose. A Forbidden Purpose. And uh, I believe that oftentimes you and I get into, we feel the sense of what we think needs to happen and we want to get it done real quick. And sometimes God says no for a certain reason, and I want to share that with you tonight. A Forbidden Purpose. Um, there was a lady that attended a missionary service several years ago, and as she heard the missionary share the stories of danger and success and, and what God was doing in the particular field that they represented, and she knew that God was calling her to be a missionary, and she prayed about it. She talked to several people about it, got some uh, direction and wisdom. She just knew that God was calling her to be a missionary, and so she had uh, no doubts in her mind. And so when she graduated high school, she went to school to prepare to become a missionary. And she graduated from college and prepared to leave for the mission field. It was at that time, however, just a few weeks before she was set to go, <clears throat> that uh, her only sister and her husband were tragically killed in a car accident. And so they, and they left four children. And this lady's parents had passed away, and she had no other siblings. So the children were given to her to care for. Mind you, this was just a few weeks before she was scheduled to leave. And so now there's no way at this point, really, that she was able to live out what she felt was her calling in being a missionary. In fact, she shuddered at the thought of putting the four precious children, her nieces and nephews, into an orphanage. And so she took these children, and ra as they were her own, and raised them in her home. And at the same time, she was devastated that she wasn't able to accomplish what she thought God had called her to. And so for the next several years, she was a devoted mother to all four of the children. She prayed for them every night. She raised them in a caring, loving home. And when the children were old enough to leave home, uh, the lady was really too old already to begin a career as a missionary, or at least she felt like it in and uh, the question often is said when you hear a story like this is, well, how could God let her down like that? Or, or was she mistaken? Or, or did she really not be called to be a missionary? Well, as it turned out, the lady's uh, sister and brother uh, were not Christian. And so all of a sudden, these four children were now raised in a Christian home. And it was also the case that all four of these children uh, that the lady raised went on to be missionaries. And so rather than just the lady being a missionary to one country, four missionaries came out of her house. It's a forbidden uh, promise. God called her to be a missionary, but what he was really calling her to do was to raise up multiple missionaries. And so you and I have to understand that God's purpose isn't always what we see it to be. And at times, its result it results, though the promise results or purpose results, in a different outcome than you and I had anticipated. And so now reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'm going to just start at verse 1. We're going to read this story. And uh, I, I think this story encapsulates what I'm trying to share with you tonight. Verse number 1, when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. And, and I want to stop there just for a second and notice that Nathan was the prophet of God and had given David release to do what was in David's heart. And then God corrected the prophet. And he said, Go and tell my servant, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? 
Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you a dynasty of kings. For when you are, uh, die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. So notice that the thing that David wanted to do, God was actually reversing and forbidding him to do it, but was raising him up in the stead. Um, he is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod like any father would. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord had said in this vision. And so this story is an interesting story. It's a powerful story. And we have the picture of this new king of Israel, the man after God's own heart. And David looks at the house that he has, the palace that he's living, and it was worthy of a palace worthy of any king. And then he looks out the window and he sees the tent where the Ark of the Lord is sitting. And the Ark of the Lord was the place where Moses placed the Ten Commandments. It was the symbol of the Lord's presence. It was his, and it was sitting in a tent. And so David thought that there was a great disparity between the great luxurious house in which he lived and the meager tent in which the presence of God dwelled. And so he had a desire to build this house for the Ark of the Lord that was at least as beautiful as his own house. He shared his plan with the prophet Nathan, who was basically the chaplain for the palace, if you will, or the prophet of God. And Nathan thought it was a great idea, but when he went to prayer that night or when he rested that night, the Lord said, hey, wait a minute, Nathan, you got to tell David, I'm not going to have David build the temple. And so David was thwarted in his efforts to provide this house or this adequate resting place for the Ark of the Lord. And uh, so here's the question that needs to be asked in this passage. Is what was wrong with David wanting to build a house for the Ark of the Lord? Well, in all reality, nothing. Uh, even Nathan the prophet said, go do all that's in your heart for the Lord is with you. And I believe that every God-loving man or woman uh, would have been in favor of putting the ark of the Lord in a respectable place and not in a tent. But God had different plans. And what we can learn from this experience of David is very key in our operating in today's mindset. Why would God forbid this chain of events? And so I want to mention a couple of things. First, he was forbidden, but he was not wrong. I want to say that again. He was forbidden, but not wrong. David, I'm talking about. God forbid David from building a temple because God had not had any temple at any point from the time he delivered the Israelites from Egypt until that time. And so God was not saying that the idea of a temple was wrong. He was saying something different. He was saying that the timing wasn't right. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 22.8, when David is talking to Solomon about building the temple, David said this to him, But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. And so David was not allowed to build the temple because he had shed blood. But God didn't totally disapprove of David's plan or idea or desire. In fact, there was two things I believe that he he did show approval of. The first was the spirit in which the offer was made. I believe that God approved of that. David's heart was in the right place. If your heart's in the right place, you just may not take the right action, but God understands and approves where that heart is or that motive is coming from. There's nothing wrong with the spirit in which David made the offer. God appreciated the motive of David's heart. Most of the time we see kings and leaders turn their back on God when they get to power and, 
and, and authority, and they look at all the wonderful things that they have, and, and they swell up with pride. But that wasn't the case with David. David was maybe just giving it into 2021 vernacular. He was lounging in the rec room and in his plush palace watching the game on TV, and he noticed uh, that it began to rain, and so he looked out the window and noticed that the house of God was just a great tent. And uh, he said, I'm living in this great palace, but uh, the Lord is, the Ark of the Lord sits in that old tent. I've got to do something about it. I know I'm going to build a great house for, for where the Lord can rest. It was a motive that was pure, a motive that was noble. And sometimes you have motives and I have motives and ideas and, and things that uh, we want to do for God that are pure and noble. And because David couldn't see or bear to see the Ark of God living in a, in a tent while he lived in the mansion. And so God looks at the motive of God's heart and he took notice. And so even though he would not allow David to fulfill the dream of building the house, he did bless David greatly. And I think the second thing that was approved of by God was the object of David's desire. Uh, I, I, the thing that God didn't say, uh, that the temple was a bad idea. He only said that David wouldn't build it. So he liked David's motive, and he didn't say that the temple was a bad idea. He just said that David wasn't the one to build it. Now, there's a couple of things worthy to take a look at when, when you're in regarding the temple. It's not where God lived. The fact that the ark of the Lord was in a tent meant that the presence of God was mobile. His presence was with his people. It wasn't in a fixed location. And that's instructive for us as well. God doesn't live in a church building, and we hear that all the time, but he lives in the people of the church. And I was always confused when I was a kid, and my mom and dad told that the church was God's house. Couldn't figure out you know, where he took a bath because we didn't have a shower there. And I also never found a bed where he could sleep. And uh, the temple is within us. It's within his people. Our hearts are the temple of God. He lives in us, not a place made of wood, stone, or brick. But the temple was a symbol of what we were going to become. So God wasn't saying that the temple was a bad idea. A church building isn't a bad idea, but it cannot become a magic place where we go to meet with God. God never designed people to have to go somewhere to meet with him. The idea of the mobile tent or the mobile tabernacle of the, the wilderness was that the God would go wherever you're at and where the people are is where God would be. Now, the temple is was important to Israel for the sake of unity. And God's uh, God told David that his offspring would build the temple. And I, I believe he's referring to Solomon uh, in part, and and I believe that um, God understands the importance of having a place to go to gather with like-minded believers, and to be a place where we can bring friends and family that don't know Him to meet. And in the New Testament, the Lord calls the church the body of Christ. Well, the church building is a place where the body gathers together, and so it's very important. So. I believe that God approved of his spirit or his motive and his objective. So my question to you tonight is, what is your spirit? What is your objective? When God denies us our desire, we must ask ourselves that question. What is our spirit and what is our objective? David's spirit was pure. His objective was noble. And that isn't always the case with us. Sometimes we have selfish motives and selfish objectives. And while our objective to be a missionary may be great, the spirit in which it was decided may be entirely wrong. And we may want that for selfish, egotistical reasons, whatever. We must examine ourselves for the motive of who we are. Even if our motives are uh, and our ob objectives are pure and right, it still may not be within God's agenda or plan. And so if that's the case, then you are just in the good company of King David. And uh, we have to understand some things now of the relationship with David to, to, to you and I. First of all, God forbid it with good reason. And if God forbids you to do something to do and go into a certain area, it's for good reason. And I believe there's four in this case with David that you can apply to, to yourself as well. God's presence wasn't confined to a location was the first one. We had just talked about the Spirit being able to move about with the people since Moses and even during the Exodus. And 
the nation of Israel had been unsettled to this point, and the Ark of the Lord in a tent kind of symbolized that situation, that God's presence was mobile, that the presence of God would go be with the people. A palatial temple was not necessary for the presence of God at that particular time. The second reason why God forbid uh, David to build the tabernacle is the absence of divine direction. I want you to notice in the passage we read that God never asked David to build the temple. It was a thought in David's mind. The Lord asked a rhetorical question in verse 7, In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God hadn't commanded that house to be built for him, and the time still wasn't right. So it wasn't, uh, there was absence of divine direction. When God doesn't direct you, it doesn't mean your idea is bad. It doesn't mean your mobile or your motive is bad. It just may be forbidden from you because it's not been directed by God for that moment. And so we have to wait on God's direction. And that goes hand in hand with the third thing, and that is the time was not right. Israel hadn't even yet fully settled the land. There were still wars going on with the neighbors. It wasn't the right time to put resources into a building a temple for the Lord. The people were not yet safe from all the enemies that lived nearby. And sometimes you and I have to wait for God's timing. Somebody once told me this, and I, I, I really believe it, is God sometimes will place things in us or give us an idea or we'll come up with an idea and it's pure. The motive is right. It's all noble. But God didn't give it to us for that moment to accomplish. He gave us that time, that uh, understanding to begin to pray to begin to read, to begin to study his word, to begin to prepare ourselves so that when the timing of God was right, either we were going to be in one of two places. We were either going to be in the place to act out what God had placed in us, or we were going to be able to support the person that God was actually calling in that time to fulfill. And that comes to place here in just a minute. Uh, because sometimes the good idea is there, but the timing isn't right. And if David had gone ahead and built the temple, it may have opened the door for attack by their enemies because it wasn't he hadn't strengthened up the other parts of the country. With manpower diverted to building the temple, the defenses of the nation may have been let down. So right, right timing is key, and the right timing is also part of the right man. I mentioned earlier that David wasn't the right man for the job, and sometimes you and I, as much as we want to be the man for the job, sometimes we're not. David had fought off the enemies of Israel. His hands were bloody as a result, and the Lord wanted someone that wasn't warlike to build his temple. And so the temple, or the Lord wanted uh, someone to build it who was peaceful, and along comes Solomon, who was just that man. By the time Solomon became king, the nation of Israel was at peace. The construction could begin. Everything was settled in the nation. And Solomon is given most of the credit. In fact, it's called Solomon's Temple. Solomon's given most of the credit for the building of the temple. But if you read scripture closely, it was David who drew up the plans and gathered the material. David played a significant part in the building of the temple, but he didn't actually get to build it. And that's something that you and I sometimes don't grasp a hold of. Because it's not getting done by us. Sometimes we don't think God's not getting it done or we're not getting it done. But sometimes when God's right man and right time and right objective align, sometimes that means you and I have to step from, yes, you gave that to me 10 years ago. I've been praying, studying, preparing, and now you're raising up John Doe to, to, to lead this ministry or lead this activity. And I need to come along and give up what David gave up, which was the plans and the materials and the resources and let the other person run with it because God's timing is right. So perhaps we're not the right person for the job. Perhaps we may play a role, but God has someone else in mind. The lady who was to be a missionary that we opened our lesson with tonight played a role that was different than she thought it was, but yet she was still fulfilling the role of a missionary because she influ influenced four missionaries and raised four missionaries in her house. Her efforts were actually multiplied even though she wasn't the right person to go overseas. 
I also want you to notice that the purpose was of, of to David was forbidden with a gracious manner. God was extremely gracious in the manner in which he forbid David from building the temple. He showed David regard, first of all. He let David know that he was held in high esteem. Twice in this passage, the Lord refers to David as my servant David. It shows me that, that God was pleased with David. He also reminded David what, of what he had already done. He reminded David that he had taken him from the pasture and following sheep, and the Lord had been with him. He had taken him through the defeat of Goliath and all of the other things that he did. David had conquered Jerusalem when no one thought that was going to be possible. And so David had done great things. He had brought stability to the land of Israel after the tumultuous reign of King Saul. And so then because of that, he reminds David that stability was important. Verse 10 and 11 say, I will appoint a place for my people and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. So God was reminding David that stability was necessary for someone to carry out the plan. Stability is vital even today of carrying out the, if we don't have faithful people at the helm, when the time is right to let something explode or build or construct, oftentimes the instability will cause that construction to crash. And then David, or God promised David an enduring dynasty. At the end of verse 11, he says, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And then in verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. See, God had desired to build a house for God, but God said that he was going to build a house for David. The word house doesn't mean the same thing in both cases. The house that David wanted to build was of a physical nature, but the house that God would build is a family. And when we speak of royalty, we refer to the family as the house of, or the royal family Ingham is the house of Windsor. The Windsor family is the royal family. God is telling David that his royal family would last forever. And so, uh, and bringing this kind of to a close, the forbidden nature of David's desire was not because God was angry, but it was for a larger purpose. God's purpose was larger than David could have ever imagined. And David simply wanted to build a house for the ark of the Lord, but God had a bigger purpose. God's purpose involved something larger, more tangible. David's plan involved building a temple or a building. The temple was a temporary structure. What Solomon did want, did wind up uh, building the temple, it was destroyed. In fact, the temple of the Lord was destroyed a few different times. It was ruined. And so God's plan involved such, something that would last longer than any stone structure. It involved the plan of salvation for the entire world. Verse 12 says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Now Solomon's kingdom didn't last forever. Even the line of David as earthly kings ended. But if you read chapter one of the book of Matthew, the first words of the New Testament say this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Messiah came through the descendants of David. And Jesus is referred to over and over again as the son of David. So God's greater purpose in the plan for David's life involved the Savior of the world, the building of the house of God, according to what Paul said in Ephesians, a building fitly framed together, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, Listen, the temple that Solomon ended up building is long gone, but Jesus is still on the throne, and the body of Christ is still alive and well. And so if God would not have forbidden David to build the temple, instead he had David build the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is the church of God, which is you and me, flesh and blood that has been overtaken by the Spirit of God. David's plan was good and noble, but God's plan was bigger and better. And so I want to close with this tonight to let you know that just because you have an idea and it doesn't seem to be playing out doesn't mean that God doesn't like you. 
He's turned his back on you. He has forbid you because he didn't like you or wasn't pleased by your motive, by your heart. Oftentimes, he's pleased with it, but he's got a bigger picture for you in, in mind, a greater opportunity in the works. And so you and I would be wise to do as David did, and that is help the next person raise up the thing that is on our heart, do what that lady did, and raise up those four missionaries, do what others have done throughout the course of time, and become a support, because eventually God will take the the Davids in the world and will create something huge and massive, and that's what I want to be a part of. So sometimes we're forbidden to do what we think is what God wants us to do, and God just kind of closes the door, and we think that we're off kilter. And No, no, no. He's just rearranging and setting up for something bigger and better for your life. So if you're struggling right now because you want to do something, there's something that's in us as humans, and I think as Christians, that we've got to be doing something. We've got to be uh, ministering in some way, involved in something. We've got to be doing something, doing, 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 doing. And God is saying, no, not necessarily. I appreciate your motive. I know your heart, your desire. I know all of that. But I've got something bigger for you. Just give it some time. Just rest in my arms and just see what the purpose that I'm forbidding now becomes the promise of what I'm going to give you then. Praise God. There's some purposes that are turning into promise even tonight. And I'm thankful for it. Praise God. God bless you tonight. I, I pray that these words would help somebody be encouraged that you're on the right track, even though it may not seem like it sometimes, that you can just rest in the arms of God and his plans will come to fruition. Praise God. Let's dismiss in prayer. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.